So I, I would propose that we take a look at tasks and issues separately. That would be my suggestion. And then I have comments to make about issues, but I wanted to sort of pull the group to see what do you think about that, whether you know we should separate those discussions before getting into it deeper. I, I really like that suggestion, Fariba, and I wonder if it would help organize us if we created that kind of rubric where we have the issues, um, maybe like in one column, and then the company tasks right next to it. Um, it may be onerous, but I think that it could be comprehensive to go through all of it. And we may not finish all of that for what we set out for, to t I guess, the issues for today. So um, l l let me start a document and, and see if I, if I can help. Um, if I understand what you're saying. So I will screen share this and we'll see it as I'm going. So I think you're saying the um, tasks, I'm gonna do it as a table. Do this for now. So I think you're saying tasks and then issues. So here, like a task would be legal advice. Uh, what is another task in court representation? Yeah, preparation of documents. Trial prep, yeah, prep documents, trial prep. Yeah, and just coach like, somebody to represent themselves in court. Yeah. Would you consider that part of like hearing preparation for Eva? Hearing yeah, a slash trial, trial prep, preparation? Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, 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 but, you're, but trial prep is when you're, you're doing trial prep for yourself and you're going to litigate or trial prep for a self-represented litigant to represent themselves. Do you see those as two different things? Yeah, maybe, yeah, it is. Yeah. Maybe like trial. Trial prep coaching or. Okay, yeah, that's exactly the word, I, the verb I was gonna go for, Leah. Okay. What about conducting a deposition? I would put that on par, Sharon, with, with uh, an in-court appearance. Now, I would say during a deposition, much like the support person in a domestic abuse hearing, I wouldn't, conceptually, I'm not offended by if they're not participating, but they're assisting the improper uh, self-represented party. So in other words, they're an employee of a party, so they're allowed to sit in in the deposition, and they're able to consult with the self-represented party if there's, oh, I don't know, free will, uh, making objections. There's so much during, strategizing, uh, forgive me for interrupting, that goes into discovery. No, it can make a, or break a case in my opinion. Yeah. You know, and I've done a lot of, uh, you know, thought, uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in our office because we can certainly help with discovery in my office and certain family law facilitators offices do. We don't because I, my, um, I, you know, direct this office and my opinion is that there's so much strategizing that goes into preparing your case for a hearing to get those facts out. It's, you know, it's just really um, involves a lot of skill specialized skill and if you're saying hey maybe we should take a look at it and have courses and education available to really train these paraprofessionals because there's a need definite need out there then okay but uh, miss you know absent that kind of a training i really think that discovery should be left out but mm -hmm. except for form interrogatories and things like that so maybe like uh, written discovery okay Okay. Would you um, have involvement in mediation as a category? Yeah. In well, some capacity, oh, so go ahead, Freeba. Oh, sorry. They can do it now, right? There's no regulations on who can mediate. You talked about, you said mediation, right, Sharon? Did I hear yeah. you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is no limitation right now. Anybody can hang a sign and say, I'm a mediator. I do think that it takes special skill, but I also think you can train a non-lawyer to mediate very effectively. Sharon, were you thinking of the paraprofessional being the mediator or counseling a, a self-represented party during the mediation? 
I was thinking more about the latter. Okay. So I think, I think, yeah, I think that actually could be really valuable because if they're giving legal advice, they could help educate a self-represented party if they're taking maybe a position that's not supported by the law. And also if they're running, if, if they're, if, if they know how to run child support calculation, how to interpret it, they know what data can be entered. They can actually give a lot of help to the self-represented litigants during mediation to understand the child support calculation and not take an unreasonable position. Yeah, my rent should be added in there. You know, well, you know, rent can be something like that. I don't want to use the word propertizer and we can't use that in a legal document, but the equivalent of a proper preparing property schedules mm -hmm. and preparing support calculations. Cause that's, that, that's all going to come under the gamut of, of giving legal advice. We want to be careful not to get into the, again, the, type of issues such as family law. We're still talking about tasks. So what is the way we can generalize that um, uh, task that into a task, not, you know, property schedules, are they kind of general? They're, is that preparation of documents? Does it fall under preparation of documents? Yeah, and I had a little, I'm, I'm breaking that one down on my list, Leah, because to me, I think there's differential pleadings for sure, written discovery, um, so I'll hold back my two that are family law specific for you, but I'm going to put those below. Because I think when we get into issues, definitely preparing uh, the disclosures are something that they can definitely do. Got it. Very valuable. What about adding, um, filing an appeal as a task? Appellate advocacy, like appellate, maybe in that general way. Yeah. Or just filing an appeal. Yeah, I think that's good because there's such strict diet guidelines and different diet guidelines, but as long as the education program includes specific instruction on the difference between a writ and an appeal and a motion for reconsideration versus an outright appeal, that, that easily can be ported over to a paraprofessional model because that's really specific. Mm -hmm. And attorneys aren't taught those in law school, the, the, the deadlines. Steve, I wonder um, if you've had a case where you wanted to prepare it at trial level for possible appeal. Do you do any prep work? Like, do you have to make sure that things are done in a certain way so that in case you have to appeal it, you have your ducks in a row, so to speak? Absolutely. They're going to have to be taught about requesting court reporters. They're going to have to be familiar with the right of uh, an indigent party to have a court reporter provided for them in some jurisdictions. And Freebo, really what I do, um, I, did, I did more appeals earlier in my career. Now, usually I'm calling Garrett up and I get him involved, but I'm dealing again with you know, high net worth cases. So, but that's what I did on my last one. So and these stats could be, I mean, in terms of preparing, giving information and legal advice about you know, most representative litigants don't appeal anything, but I'm just th thinking that's yeah. because they don't know how do they don't know they have a right, you know, they don't get their ducks in a row. So I'm thinking that's something that a power professional could possibly be uh, trained to do. Yeah. What about um, drafting declarations um, and gathering the supporting evidence in support of those declarations, whether it's for a restraining order or a response to a restraining order? Um, would that need to have its own task? I, I, I think that's a good, I, I had it broken down a little more on the documents. Maybe, I don't know if you can tab over and put subcategories under preparation of documents. So put pleadings, Leah, written discovery, motions, requests for orders, and then briefs. You can't really call them trial briefs because we do hearing briefs too. And compiling supportive evidence, helping, because sometimes people might ask what, what should I produce to support this position? Would, would the paraprofessional help with that? So maybe underneath motions, 
or actually exhibits would be another because we have to file those separately in most jurisdictions anyway. I think that could be very helpful, um, especially these days with uh, text and email and it, we often get the question about that pictures uh, be very helpful. Yeah, if we, if we had an Adobe course right now for paraprofessionals, they'd make a killing because the lawyers don't know, 90% of them don't know how to hyperlink. <laughs> I'm, I'm also thinking of things that we've seen in legal aid that have been doozies, so like quadros. Would you fit quadro under preparation of property schedules? Uh, I probably would say, you know, oh, orders. Orders, orders and, after hearing, yes. Orders, and that's a huge one. So that would, the quadros would come underneath that one, Sharon. Mm -hmm. So I would actually put that under the, and that's there underneath the preparation of documents. It's all caps, QDRO. Yeah, qualified yeah. domestic relations. So here's the thing with, with the domestic relations order. If you're dealing with a public entity my, my legal assistants draft those for me because I've got the forms from PG&E, from CalSTRS, CalPERS, but that easily can be done and is already being done by LDAs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't have a problem. I think it, it gets trickier when you're dealing with, instead of a defined benefit plan, a defined contribution plan, the 401ks, the deferred comp. So are we getting into issues or are we still into tasks? Because I think quadros are orders. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you are. I think you're right. I think you're right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Orders. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, we all do that, right? So I think orders and judgments, you know, within the realm of orders, we're talking judgments, we're talking quadros, we're talking just preparing the document after the, the court is yes. done making its yeah. orders. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. But that would be, and especially the domestic relations or I, <laughs> So I have a case where the other side hired the quadro expert. And after the third version, he still hasn't got it right. And this is someone is, that holds himself as a domestic relations order expert. And I have had at least in 25 years, five or six cases where people sat on that part of it and didn't get it done for 10 or 15 years and created huge issues. Um, because no no one wants to deal with it. No one wants it. I, you know, other than the rote ones, I farm them out. Uh, that brings up another issue on the pleadings. Do you think I need, there should be a subcategory for Reba or Sharon or Elizabeth on, uh, that deals with, uh, Joinders. 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 Yeah. Maybe specifically put those. Is, as an issue or or under pleadings? I would put, I would put it right underneath pleadings. It's, it's a general category because you've got joinders of grandparents. You've got joinders of people that are holding property that are not retirement plans. And you've got the very easy joinders for defined benefit plans. Well, actually mm -hmm. any, any retirement plan. Mm -hmm. That would be a huge help because what happens is if, if someone can't afford a lawyer and they're going to use a paraprofessional, the paraprofessional can, can either do a joinder that'll freeze the retirement plan so no one can abscond with it while the divorce is pending in violation of the standard family law restraining orders. You've seen that before, right, Fariba? <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth, have you come across that yet? Yeah. I, I am just wondering um, if we could also include um, list pendants, those are so useful and easy. They're forms, you know, that you can serve on the insurance companies and file or record if there's any property to protect um, against fraudulent transfers and things like that. Um, can you repeat that, Freeba? Yes, I don't know, Steve, do you do list pendants when you start a case, serve on the health insurance? Yeah, L-I-S space P-E-N-D-E-N-S. I don't, and I've seen them misused. And this is where, if we include Liz Pendens in there, then <laughs> mandatory insurance has got to be required because someone could be, be really harmed by a Liz Pendens. Is, is it LIS space P? Oh, it, would, it would actually be e under pleadings. Yeah, ENS. It P wouldn't be issues. It would be pleadings. 
And it's L I S P N B N B E N S. Two words. Two words. Two words. Space between. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I I see it misused even by lawyers mm -hmm. um, because it's a with the lawyers involved, I can eventually get the sanctions against the party, but I would be, I think it's, I guess maybe it comes down to the educator. The quick answer is I hate them. <laughs> um, especially like I've seen somebody file a Liz Pendens recently when the house was titled in both parties' names. Mm -hmm. So all it did was put a cloud on title that didn't need to be there because mm -hmm. there, nothing was going to happen with the property. So we can leave it under and take it off. I think it may be just a matter of education. Yeah, I think so. They could, no, they could yeah. be taught better than the lawyers, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, instead of O is F, capital F in front of, right above judgments, Leah. There. <sighs> Else. I think I'm going to take preparation of property schedules off because I think yeah, yeah. in here. But what about the child support generating the calculation? I think that is a bit of a discrete task from what we've talked about before. It may be that it's so issue specific that it's um, I think probably going to come under the legal advice, but and, and it's going to come under the exhibits. In other words, they're going to advise people. Clearly, they should be able to do it. self represent Anybody can go onto the state calculator right now. It's not as good as the private versions, but anybody can do it. I'm, I'm getting people coming into me with their own support calculations, and then I'm advising them, well, no, you did this wrong or that wrong, but they're getting to the calculator and using it. So you got, I think you're right that it could be issues and it could be tasks. I, I would put support calcs because for temporary so, spousal support, you could run a calc. So I would just put support calc, and I, I'm a proponent of uh, really having training paraprofessionals to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because it's um it's a formula, and so basically you just plug in the information on the formula. They fill out their FL one hundred and fifties, and you just transfer the information on the FL one hundred and fifties to the software. So. Yeah, and I think a PAC professional could go a long way in teaching self-represented litigants what goes in there and calming them down. But my rent, but my food, but if you, they're hiring somebody to help them and they tell them, well, you know, only this can go, this kind of information can go in, or you can't use the spousal support calculation for permanent support or things like that. I think it, it could really Yeah, I don't see it so much as legal advice because all, when people run cal the support calculations, they're putting the people in a position to make informed decisions. They're not saying, hey, use these numbers. It's, hey, this is um, a guideline. And absence of an agreement, um, the judge can order something Some similar. Parts of it, in my opinion, takes legal advice, and those are the discretionary uh, uh, deductions, the discretionary numbers that could be entered, like a hardship, should it be half, should it be whole. So I think that you're right. Most of it is not legal advice, but there's definitely some parts. Would you agree? Like imputed income. That I think there can be lots yeah, of Yeah, disputed stuff. income for sure. Yeah. How to, how to allocate the dependencies. Yeah. Okay. So we have it here. All right. So here's our task list. Can we... Can, so I think the... Elephant in the room is the in court representation. Who the members on the committee, uh, subcommittee for family law are Elizabeth, Fariba, Sharon, and myself, correct? Is that right, Linda? Linda? I don't, I don't have the um, list in front of me, but let's assume that's the case. Okay. Right. So. My feeling is I was having trouble unmuting. Um, <laughs> is there anybody else on the sub the subgroup for family law that I missed, Linda? Uh, let me just double check that for you. Um, uh, I can, I'll pull that up. Yes. 
for family, we have uh, Sharon, you, Dana, Elizabeth, and Fariba. Oh, oh so Dana. Yes. Dana is on the call on this meeting. Oh, gotcha, but muted right now. Okay. So my strong, strong feeling and position is that in-court representation should be taken off the table. And I base that on the input I've got from the judicial officers uh, that I've, panel, uh, I've spoken to. I base it on no other programs, either pending or already approved, have allowed in-court work by the paraprofessionals. I think it's something that the, the harm that could be caused by including it is far outweighed by the benefit. And the fact is, is if the program is successful, you can always revisit that issue down the road. Because as the judicial officers start seeing more work product that's been generated by paraprofessionals, they may then say, take a different position. So I'd like to call for a vote on the issue of just whether or not uh, in-court representation should be allowed. My motion is that paraprofessionals not be allowed to provide in-court representation or services in family law. Do you have any exceptions to that, Stephen, like in domestic violence, restraining order hearings? How about we do it? I'm going to take that as a friendly amendment, except as we specifically provide in the domestic abuse area. So, like Sharon, this is counter to the recommendation on collateral criminal. I just want to make sure there's logical coherence to what we're doing. Um, you know, as a group. And can I speak to that? This is Dana. Yeah. I am wondering if we couldn't put some parameters around that, much like Stephen, what you had suggested in Sybil. Could there be a dollar amount? Could we start with unions that don't have children? Because the need here is so great and having spent just only one day of my life in the busiest family law courthouse in California on Hill Street in Los Angeles, I have a hard time believing that judges would rather see pro per after pro per than having some kind of educated representative with some of these people with low value uh, disillusions. Um, this is Fariba. I, um... I would agree that we need to discuss this more. I disagree that we would uh, we would come up with a with a we can come up with a hybrid, but it can't be. They can do full representations if this and this and this exists, and they can do no representation. I think they either do representation or they don't because. The reasons are the same. Is that thinking on your feet, having those skills, having the knowledge that you're not going to have as a paraprofessional. Lawyers have that, you know, because of the education and what they go through. Now, I do think there is a way to do it. Family Code Section 6303 is the section that governs what a support person in a domestic violence case can do, right, or cannot do. We can come up with a sort of a um, sort of a definition. Fariba? Uh, am I? Yeah. You're good now. You're good now. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, with the definition of what they can do, um, maybe they, we call it court accompaniment, something where they're not silent because 6303 is very clear. A support person can't say anything, but, but that they don't represent and that we make it really clear so there is no uh, false um, or, or misplaced um, reliance of the self-represented uh, client on their paraprofessional that they're going to come in and rescue me. No, you have the role of representing yourself, but maybe the paraprofessional can be there to organize their evidence and maybe write a little note. Um, you know, uh, maybe beforehand they've done prep and talked about objection and objections and what this means and what that means. And I don't know, I'm just kind of brainstorming here, but maybe to prompt them, hey, hearsay or something like that, because they've already prepped, they've already worked with each other. And, um, and like I said, list of documents to, to present and the steps they have to go through, for example, to 
you know, establish foundation. I don't litigate, so my apologies if my comments are out of place sometimes. But, I have, you know, uh, kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fariba. I agree. Um, I have a suggestion. I actually think that if we're able to, um, the paraprofessional is able to give more guidance on the child support, on the spousal support, on the, that we're going to have less cases going to court because people mm -hmm. are going to have the information that they need to settle outside of court or to reach out to an attorney, to reach out to a mediator. So I think that the more power we give them behind the scenes, it will um, alleviate the need for them to go to court. But with that being said, I would like to see people be able to give more assistance at the courthouse, uh, whether it's um, just being allowed to sit at the table next to the represented pro per, that might be one thing. Um, but, uh, but absent allowing a paraprofessional, we're going to have the same thing we have now, where 80% of um, individuals are representing themselves. And the judges are having to take the time to educate each and every pro per that sits at that table. And, um, and it's taking up too much resources and backlogging the courts. And so we have to do something. Yeah, yeah I'm having a hard time, Fariba, understanding why the status quo is better than um, licensing paraprofessionals through a regulated structure to represent people in court who currently aren't represented. So like, obviously it's the best solution to get a lawyer, but all these people aren't getting lawyers. So why is it like being able to think on your feet, people that are emotional and in a conflict it often show up very poorly in those circumstances. So if the choice is between an individual self-represented litigant doing that themselves versus a paraprofessional who's licensed and regulated doing it, I guess I'm struggling to understand why that's worse than the status quo. Um, I don't, I need to see, perhaps this is putting the cart before the horse, but I would need to see the education module that's going to accompany these new rules and regulations and new category of uh, legal professionals. Because I've seen so many abuses and I don't think setting up self-represented litigants for failure is a better option to going in it by themselves. I really, I really need to see what are we talking about here. And with all due respect, I think to the really ethical uh, legal document assistance out there, there are so many abuses that I see, we see in our business here at the Self-Help Center statewide, that I'm really um, very careful, very conservative about how, um, how far do we go in this. And I do think sending somebody in there alone versus somebody who is just not ready to do what they're saying they can do is, is a better option. Um, and I really encourage us not to arrive at it from that desperation point of view that isn't it better to send them in with somebody than nobody? I, 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 the answer is uh, to me is no, it is not better. But again, you could ha set up this really great training program where they pass all this um, milestones and they do continuing education and they have to get insurance because there are bad lawyers out there too, right? So I'm um, you know, they're definitely bad lawyers. We're required to have malpractice insurance. In right? But yes. they, exactly. Not, exactly. Not required to disclose if they don't have it in their written retainer agreements. Yes, in the in the okay. pretty small font. Okay. But I, I hope I've answered your question about that. Yes, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I feel like everyone in this room is on the same page. Like, we are trying to do the hard task of reconciling the number one need, um, and that's like universal across all jurisdictions, which is family law. Like you go to um, any courtroom and you see how many folks are unrepresented and there's so much at stake. We're talking about um, custody, access to, to one's kids, um, support, um, the ability to get a divorce, um, the ability to, to be safe, you know, by getting a restraining order, but um, we're also reconciling that against some of the irreparable harm that can happen um, with, you know, some of these hearings and also like the high bar to know, to like knowing what you're doing. To me, I'm really curious, Stephen, like what came out of your conversation with Bonnie Huff? And I'm also curious with these other states who, you know, similarly have family law as a number one need, like no doubt. 
why they, like most of them carved out um, the ability to represent in court as a no-go. The, the part of the conversation I've had with Bonnie so far has been superficial and was more mm -hmm. document oriented, not courtroom. I had not heard from her what Leah indicated was that, that she fills the in courts there. So that's the email after today's meeting, I'm email, emailing the, the judicial group. But we can also invite, invite her to speak to all of you. Right, I know that's independent of what I'm doing though. Yeah. So what, what I'm what I'm saying with regards to that I don't have an answer directly on that one, Sharon. Mm -hmm. I I don't I feel so strongly that if eliminating the line between what it means to be a lawyer versus a paraprofessional by allowing individuals who have not graduated from law school and passed the bar exam to then start being advocates in the courtroom. It is going to create a dilution of the quality of courtroom work that's done when it's not being done uh, by the parties in, in, that are self-represented. I think that this would be such a huge leap compared to every other program. You could be creating a circumstance that in the end would undermine the paraprofessional program because after three or four horror stories of what happened with a a uh, paraprofessional who made an appearance and did not deal with a certain evidentiary issue or substantive issue correctly, that that could cause a um, groundswell against using paraprofessionals. And ultimately, we, we don't need to take that big leap at the start. I think that I, where, where I like what Fariba was suggesting, I'll withdraw my motion because I want to amend it now. A paraprofessional should not be allowed to make an appearance in a proceeding, but we can look at whether what kind of courtroom support they should can prov provide. They can be sitting there in a non-Zoom time, sitting behind the, the bench, uh, and, or sitting behind the bar and handing somebody notes or paperwork. We see that all the time. So creating that fiction that they can't cross over to council table, I, I think that that would be viable to have them there as a support person to help organize the, the self-represented party to present documents. I don't know if about using, I, I got this image in my head, Fariba, of evidence flashcards. Like they're, they've got their hearsay, they've got their foundation and they're whipping those over. I don't know if I think that's the right scope. But in terms of organizing argument and responding to things and having them there um, as a support person maybe even broader scope than the family bonds. I think that that's viable, but crossing over to where they are becoming an advocate is crossing a boundary that should not be crossed based on the other programs. As I said, the feedback I've got from the judicial officers that I've spoken to, and I'm gonna put that in a more refined form because I, I expect to have a report from them before this subgroup finishes. But, I, I feel very strongly that this would be detrimental to the program. And again, I, I don't want to address the political issues of we have to promote, we have to put forth a proposal that actually can pass through the legislature. And if you include a provision that says that um, paraprofessionals can be advocates and make appearances in cases, you are far more likely to get opposition from advocacy groups like, a, you know, I don't know what AFCC is going to do. I don't know what ACFLS is going to do. I don't know what the AML is going to do. And more importantly, I don't know what CLA is going to do. But you including that as, as, as part of the initial program could end up being fatal to this. Can I also add that, I'm sorry, I just want to say uh, one point Elizabeth made, I totally agree that they can play a major role in meet and confer sessions mm -hmm. right outside the court. Uh, well, in our court, we're trying to make everything uh, 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 virtual so people don't have to come to the building and don't know what's going to happen. But those, you know, hallway discussions, I think there's a lot of room for help uh, where there, uh, especially in lopsided cases where we see a lot of abuses uh, that where the self-represented litigant is misled uh, outside of the court and a stiff goes in and the judge signs something that the 
the, the self-represented litigant totally didn't understand and they signed uh, non clets orders, anybody? Uh, I hate those. Um, so yeah. I think that they can do a lot of good in negotiations and meet and confer to, to sort of help their client. Um, they, so in a way, they're, they're not advocates in, inside the courtroom during the hearing, but they can, they can help their client in meet and confer and negotiations. Elizabeth, I'm going to call you. I just want to throw one thing. And I believe my understanding is the program in Arizona, those uh, advocates will be allowed to advocate and represent in court. So I just want to uh, clarify it's not no other jurisdiction. Um, and uh, just like we could have Bonnie talk to the group, we could have folks from others. I wasn't clear about that. Just by, yeah. That. yeah. Okay, Elizabeth, go ahead. I just wanted to say that, you know, um, at the end of the day, who has the final decision regarding any decision or legal advice that comes forward, um, it's going to be the client themselves. So even if they're given, oh, I suggest, I recommend you do this, at the end of the day, the party will make the decision. And if not, the judge will make the decision. So it's not like whatever the advocate recommends is the final outcome. I believe that to be true as well. Do you I'm looking at the Arizona rules. I guess it's a little confusing to me because it says um, they can appear before except where prohibited by the rules and procedures of the forum. Yeah, and they you know what that means. Yeah, my understanding is we talked about a month ago to the woman running the, the DV aspect of the program. And my understanding is they're, they've changed the rules so that paraprofessionals can appear in court, but would be happy to invite her to speak to this group. I think that'd be helpful. I'll, I'll table, I'll table. I would draw on my motion, so I'll table it for the next meeting. I also believe that local, that may mean that local courts can make their own rules about what they're gonna allow to happen in the courts. Um, this is a riot, so I might just chime in from a consumer perspective because I, I'm, I'm Sing I was a single mom and I um, had to be going through the family law system um, for many, many years. So I would hope that you would reconsider and not decide to not allow paraprofessionals provide representation in court because as a consumer, the value, huge value would be to have someone there to advocate on your behalf. And having been a single mom, it's not always feasible to pay $350 an hour to get attorney representation. So it's great to have someone to like fill out the paperwork for you, but the day of the court when you, the emotions are loaded, when you have all your speeches ready, but then you end up in court and you don't know what to say, it's kind of daunting to be in front of the judge and then the opposing counsel and so forth, to have someone there in your corner to advocate or speak on your behalf, there's huge value in that as a consumer, for me, from my perspective. And like Fariba uh, pointed out, there are good attorneys and there are bad attorneys, and I'm assuming that we're going through this program and we're gonna to put together a robust certification process. So I'm, I'm imagining that the paraprofessionals are not going to just have high school diploma or graduated from paralegal school without any training or experience to then be certified as paraprofessionals. So as a consumer, I feel like with the robust certification process that the state board will have in place, I will be feeling confident going with the paraprofessional because I've had attorneys, legal certified in specialists that caused me the entire case. Right. Was the, they didn't was, do their due diligence. What was the other party in your case um, represented or unrepresented? So the other party was represented with a by a less experienced attorney, not a certified specialist. And I was represented by a certified specialist with many, many, many years of experience. And I ended up doing a lot of the research, a lot of the on um, case law and writing a lot of my own declarations because the other, my attorney dropped the ball. Was it a question of not having the funds to pay them to do the work or they just weren't doing the work for you? No, 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 I paid. I paid $350 an hour and I took a loan to pay that. 
So part of the passion and excitement in family law is because I have a 10 year old. So his father is still not out of the picture. So at some point I may have to go through a trial or hearing again and to have to pay $350 an hour to, to an attorney to do that, it's not going to be feasible for me always. So having a paraprofessional that can be providing representation, that will be great. Someone like me, I know how to do a lot of my own paperwork and declarations and motions and ex parte motions and such. But I need that support at court during a hearing. So I just want to jump in. I think it's really great to hear a consumer perspective happens to be a state bar staff person. And it's um, hard for us to get true consumer voice on any of our various working groups where we've been looking at these issues. Um, I think Araya speaking to her actual experience just kind of highlights that. We hear from a lot of lawyers and judges and other people, and it's helpful to hear from, from consumers. Um, Regardless I totally, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Now, what I'm hearing Araya say um, is that the, I think the same point about training. And um, I rely a lot when I talk to people and I refer them to lawyer referral services that, you know, it's about the state bar and, you know, the kind of requirements that the state bar has. And I think if you really, really have a great, like I said, robust certification program with a lot of training opportunities and requirements and um, also monitoring, you know, um, I think that could, that could go a long way. Additionally, it may be, um, you know, when I'm hearing about Arizona and their rule, I'm thinking they do, they may leave a lot up to local courts to decide. And because in, I think you're gonna get a lot of local courts that know people in their jurisdiction or in their venue, in their area, who, and they know reputations and the judges can see, um, what for you know we all have our poo poo list right <laughs> you know and, and your reputation is golden and word gets around so they can tell you know who the good ones are and who the bad ones are and we may want to leave some things to the local court and maybe that's what arizona does and i would be very curious to know if um leah you're gonna talk to the um, person that runs that program whether that's what they mean by their regulation yeah so it's it's one and i want to be respectful of your time I'm wondering if you, we can get clear about who we should invite for the next meeting. I think this is a great, made a lot of headway here with this list. And Stephen, if you have other edits or, you know, I'll send this around, but let's make sure this reflects the discussion today. Okay. We can, I can invite the um, head of the Arizona program. We can invite Bonnie. If we want to dig into in-court representation at the next meeting, maybe inviting two people to talk to you. Um, or if you want to take another approach, we could just spend a couple minutes focused on that so that we have our marching orders of staff in terms of what we should try to do for the next meeting. I'm thinking that inviting both, I would really be interested to hear too from the Arizona administrator or whatever title is, um, what the billing rates are for the paraprofessionals that do the in-court appearances and compare that to what the average family law attorney rates are in Arizona as well, if that's data that she has accessible. Because we may be saying that we're going to create this program that's going to solve a need, but I would expect that anybody who was good and effective in an in-court setting as a paraprofessional, I would expect them to bill close to what an attorney bills per hour. Yeah, I will ask her, but I don't think she's going to have that because I don't think the program is actually fully launched yet. Okay, yeah. so I think that, so, and, and I guess that's the ultimately come back to, we can always, well, we won't be around then, but things can be added to this paraprofessional program down the road. Yeah. If you create a program that has multiple opportunities for failure, you undermine the program. And so my concern would be, this would be a pretty aggressive step to take in terms of um, diluting that boundary between paraprofessional and attorney. And my strong feeling is it should not be included in the initial program, but saved as something for consideration after you have two years or three years of the program being in place 
and you see how the how the what this what the standard of work is, what the quality of work is that's coming from the paraprofessionals. Perhaps it's a, you know that's possible that you launch a program in stages. You know we're, yeah. we're right now going from nothing, and we're I think when we're discussing, I'm thinking you want to launch every aspect of this at the same time, where you don't have to. You could just little by little um, start it and and pilot it. Um, I hope that's that's one of the possibilities. I would want to know from Arizona if um, I thought I heard you say, Leah, that they haven't fully launched the program, so there are no stats. I don't I don't think so, but I I will circle back with her. Okay, so I would want to know also if they have any feedback, um, any examples uh, of stories out there. What happened was great, and this person did this. I, I don't know if they have a way of collecting that information. That would be useful. I think that um, we should add Bonnie Huff to the list of people to talk to. Yes. And I would also like to talk to a family law program from a state that's been doing this for a while, um, just to see what, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what they've learned from the process, what some of their considerations were, and to learn more about their parameters around allowing paraprofessionals to go into court. Okay. So that's Washington and Utah. Washington, as you know, voted to discontinue their program. And there's been a lot of political turmoil there. Um, but I can certainly find someone and try to find someone in Washington or Utah. I think if we heard from Bonnie Huff, someone from Washington and someone from Arizona, like maybe in one meeting and you know, basically give us 20 minutes to do a Q&A with them, each of them, that would be helpful. Okay. Maybe, um, Linda, when is, the, or Araya, when is the next meeting of this group? The 10th, next Monday. Next Monday? Okay. Um, we, could you all, if we extend it to be an hour and a half, if we're able to get all three, is that something that would work for you all? Checking. Uh, we were set at one o'clock. If we started it at twelve thirty, yes, and I could probably push my two o'clock appointment back. So, it works yeah. for me too. We, yeah, we can't start it earlier because of the Bagley Keen requirement of uh, um, a, a ten days notice. We can extend it, but we can't change the start time. Okay, I'll move the appointment that I have then that day. And I can make it work until two thirty. Okay, or three. Okay. I can oh, make it work. All right. Yeah. I can too. Dana? Yep, I'm in. All right, great. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>